We are the sons and daughters of the soul. We are resilient and forever forward thinking. We ask for nothing else than the opportunity to live and to create the lives that we were meant to live. We want nothing but an equal chance at options and possibilities. The same possibilities and options to live out our potential as our fellow man. We want to be heard, understood, and expressive in our reality. We are the future. We are the creative. We are here. And you're listening to Urbanology with my dad, Tony Rogers, on WHCR 90.3 FM New York. Good afternoon, Tony Rogers here, your host for Urbanology, the Art of War. And uh, as many of you know, uh, my birth certificate has William Anthony Rogers on it, not necessarily Tony, but uh, over the years, uh, Tony has become what many of my friends and associates know me as. Matter of fact, I, I write a column and it has W.A. Rogers, and people say, is that your dad or whatever? But, but, the, but that's uh, something that um, I guess many of us, you know, have our nicknames and, and the like. Today uh, is, uh, is a, always a good day. Whenever you can get up, is a good day. But I have the pleasure of interviewing a brother that I've known, wow, it must be at least 15 years, because I think my daughter was five. She's 20 now, so it's been at least 15 years when the song Urbanology, The Art of War, well, he, this brother and another of our close friend, uh, Arn Ashford, who, who's in heaven now, he and Arn Ashford wrote Urbanology. So that's just two people saying it. It sounds like a group, but they put that together and uh, they had a number of different things, but my daughter, again, uh, uh, who is um, who was five at that time, when they did the urbanology, she said, I like that one, I like that one. And that's what I said, okay, this is what it's gonna be. Kia has talked, said, said uh, that we, we, we got it. So the brother that I'm gonna introduce, and I, I, I can't, matter of fact, I'm gonna read something because uh it's hard to 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 talk about this brother uh and what he has done he's a, a legend in 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 his in his life so i'm happy that i'm able to talk to him i'm just looking at some i'm going to just give you some of the people that he has played with and had had some sort either as producing or playing uh miles davis Mariah Carey, Luther Vandross, Sun Ra, LL Cool J, Stevie Wonder, Alicia Keys, Ornette Coleman, Roberta Flack, Curtis Mayfield, Sly Stone, James Brown, uh, Mary J. Blythe, KR1, um, the Isley Brothers, George Clinton, The Temptations, 
uh, so many Lena Horn, uh, Joe Turner, B.B. Uh, King, Mercio Parker, and he's produced stuff, uh, did a lot of stuff with Bill Cosby, uh, the Cosby Show, Sesame Street, uh, so many different types of things that he's been involved in. Uh, but one of the nicest brothers that I know and may soon be coming out with a new album. So please uh, give a warm welcome to my guest, William Spaceman Patterson. Hey, hey. Hey, man. How you doing? All right. How you doing, Tony? I'm good. I was just trying to give some of your, you know, credits. I, I mean, it went on. I, the whole show, if I was just going to read, <laughs> if I was going to just read all of the people that you've been dealing with, uh, I'd say it's, that would it's, be the it's show. About, it's, <laughs> it's, about, it's about staying alive. That's what someone told me. One of my mentors, George Davis, back in the day, he said, you know, man, and George wrote, Tell it like it is when he was like 17 years of age. Of oh, age okay. Right? And through yeah, his whole career. Like it is for those yeah. who were not, uh, uh, who too, maybe too young to understand. Right, that. right. And, and he just said, hey, man, you know, it's just about staying alive. He said, you know, you don't have any competition because you just stay alive. That's it. <laughs> and as you do it, you just start accumulating uh, adventures and people that you get a chance to uh, experience this whole thing with. Space. Um, I know that you have talked about this, but you got to write a book, man. You know, it's funny you mention that. Like, my kids have been on my case about this for a while. And they even gave me this, this one thing of write your book, and it, and it basically you're writing outlines about different aspects and stories in your life. So I've actually started. So I will say that I'm in the process of actually writing my book. It, it is something that is happening. I just got... Uh, the software that I can talk into, and it prints it out for you. Yeah, I gotta get. I gotta talk to you about that because, I, you know, our, our our close friend Art Ashford was telling me, and that was many years ago. He says, "Tony, you need you need to start writing now. You need to start right. writing the book." Yeah, yeah. You know, if he hadn't been a, stayed alive, I, I probably would have had another. You know, a book about. Me, this is a book about, well, that's about me too, the book that I right. just put out there, but not the way that I guess, can, you know, we've been through a lot of stuff together, you know? And, yeah, yeah. And sometimes that's that, you know, once you go, you go. But let's talk a little bit, man. We're going to talk about the album and stuff that you're going to do, but I just want to get uh, the listeners and viewers uh, uh, a taste of stuff that they may never have seen about the people that they have seen all of the time. And you know, my, my first and always, I'm going to always, because I, 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 I appreciate a slide of Family Stone at that time. A lot of people may not even know who he is. <laughs> but um, right. what was it like playing with Sly Stone? Oh, Sly. Now, my story with Sly Stone is very interesting because I first, I first met Sly Stone and, and the whole group, the Family Stone, when I was 16 years of age, you know. And and the way wow. that it wind up happening is, I went to, or I think I was like 16, and I was auditioning to be a studio musician at this little studio that was in my hometown, New Brunswick, New Jersey, and uh -huh. I went to audition to get a job as a studio musician. So I go in. And, you know, we're in the room playing. And all of a sudden, this, this beautiful sister comes back. she got this big, giant red afro. And she comes in and she says, that's nice. Who's playing? I said, oh, that's me. And she said, really? And I play. She says, how do you do that? I said, oh, no, I just, I just do it. You know, I've been playing for a few years at that point. And she said, well, I have a guitar at home. And I really want to learn. And she says, I, I don't have much money, but I'm a clothes designer. And I can make some clothes for you. So I said, oh, okay, let me ask my mom. So I go tell my mom, oh, mom, this beautiful woman, she wants me to like, teach her guitar. She's older, but I, I figured I asked permission first. So I started to teach her. And all of a sudden, she opened up um, this book that had these familiar kind of jumpsuits and knicker suits and stuff. That's the book for me. And she's like, oh, there's some stuff I did for Sly and Family Stone. And I'm a kid, I'm talking, you don't know no Sly and Family Stone. And she said, yeah. 
next when they come to town next time, I'll take you to meet them. I'm like, okay. So they came to town. I, I think they were playing the Apollo or something. And, and it was one of those classic ones that they played. <clears throat> and it was um so we and there went lines around the corner. I lines around the corner lines. and and but we didn't have to deal with it because we had special backstage passes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was an opportunity to meet the family and it wound up becoming something that um, that has had grown through the years. Uh -huh. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. So it, it the, the main thing was I really dug Sly's brother, Freddie. Freddie mm -hmm. was my first point of contact. Freddie was the guitarist and Freddie was really like the lead singer. And and Freddie's history was like very, very interesting and we started jamming and playing together, hanging out. And, you know, and Sly was around. But Sly was Freddie's big brother. And, you know, big brother's little brother. There was always that thing. So I found myself siding with the little brother, saying, big brother just going through this thing. <laughs> but, but an interesting thing was that we, we first time we, we did like a real kind of jam, we went to Manny's. It used to be on 48th Street where they used to have, like, it's, it's gone now. So to talk about it, it's very historic now. On 48th Street between 6th and 7th Avenue was a bunch of music stores, music stores, Sam mm -hmm. Ash, Manny's, and, and all different places. And first time I went in Manny's was with, was with Family Stone to go shopping, right? They're going to buy instruments. And we mm -hmm. get in the store and they close the store down. You know, Manny closes, everybody out there, and set up a situation for rhythm section to be in the middle of the room and they would bring all these instruments, try this, try that. And we're jamming in Manny's so thing. And, and um, part of the entourage was a drummer who eventually played with um, Graham Central Station, Willie Sparks, uh -huh. who's part of the circle. So we're just jamming, we're playing. And Freddie's like, oh, I want that guitar or this. You know, they could shop like that. So right. that was the beginning of that. So, you know, eventually, you know, time went on. And whenever they would come to the East Coast, we'd hang out. And there were so many different kind of adventures that I, I don't know how your show is rated or you know the, the <laughs> level of the ages of the kids. And so there's certain things that I probably would not um, talk about necessarily in public. But just say that there was a lot of adventures. I saw I, one thing, I, I met this famous groupie that hung out named Cynthia Plastercaster. Now Cynthia Plastercaster had a history, uh, how do we put it? She had a collection of rock star genitalia in plastic. <laughs> so, so you know, she says, "Oh, you're you're a musician." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I play guitar." And she's like, "I'm looking down, like, whoa, 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 I'm, oh, 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 you know." <laughs> but so there was like all kind of characters that were hanging out around the scene, there. and then there was even people that that used to sing about in the songs, like the guy Plastic Jim was a cousin of theirs. You know, there was Jane as a groupie. She was, I mean, these people were like real people. Now, and they, yeah. Did you did you ever um, be involved or around when a lot of the creation of, of some of the music, some of the songs? Uh, well, okay. I I guess around that time, that, um, he was at, the, when I met Sly, he was at the pinnacle of success. He was uh -huh. like the biggest artist on the planet. He was the first artist to get a million dollars when you hand in a record. First artist. So, and he just did, there's a riot going on. So there was a period between doing that and the next record that took a while. And in between there, there would be jaunts into the studios to make them. But if we fast forward to where he decided to come on to the East Coast and knocked on James and Tume's door, mm. you know, James and Tume did Juicy Fruit right. and a bunch of other things we could talk about. Um, he wound up moving to the East Coast. And 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 Tombs and Tumay called me up and said, Hey man, you got a you got a a, a strat in the Wawa? And I'm like, Yeah, sure. Seven up, I'll be there. Went to the studio. He said, There's a friend of yours, open the door. And I opened the door and Sly had that, he had that <laughs> smile, and I said, like, oh my goodness, where did you find this guy? So he said, he came here and asked me that, I want you to produce me. So we started recording a series of stuff, of new stuff, that is like probably the only complete 
Sly Stone um, representation of that time of music that was coming from him. And, mm -hmm. and, and Toombs was able to get it out of him. We did some real incredible things. And we started, you know, working on music, you know, doing stuff together, jamming and stuff. So, yeah, it wanted, and we actually cut a record with the Bar Kays. And the tune is called Just Like a Teeter Totter. Mm -hmm. And on that tune, it's the Bar Kays with Sly, myself, and them two men. And and it's 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 out there somewhere. You can you can find it online. But just Maybe, like uh, Teeter we, Totter. So uh, I, I I know some of the young people have no idea who we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, they know the same. Frank Ocean. Frank Ocean, because my daughter oh, loves Frank oh, okay. Ocean. Okay. Oh yeah, I did. The, the talk last... a little bit about that, so some people can. can, can oh my! Because we'll, we'll my... we'll you. You know, we got something for everybody. You know, right, right, right. The time. The, the, this is my, my contemporary stuff. So so I did the last two Frank Ocean records. Um, the the one that, that came out first was one called Endless for Def Jam. And it was, and it's a record that people still, it's, people are going to get to it because there's some real special kind of elements that's going on inside of that. Um, and then, it's funny, he put that one out. That was his last record for Def Jam. And then like three days later, he released on his own Blonde, which which I'm appearing on that with him. And, you know, we were extensively in the studio creating, working on different, different things. Um, the producer who had produced Channel Orange with him, Omas Keith, had, mm -hmm. had invited me to come and work on the project. So it was... Um, it was very, very interesting. You know, um, I took one of my sons with me. He was helping be in my roadie with me, right? And um, he was like, oh, Frank Ocean. Yes, I'm excited because I had heard him, but I didn't know I didn't know how much of an influence that he has become on this new generation of singers mm. and stylists because um, he actually has something that a lot of people gravitate. I hear, I hear bits and pieces of things that we've done on a lot of new records that have come out since then. And so, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's so interesting because in talking with you, I realized that there's some time here. It's not just someone who just started to come up and, cause you know, when young people listen, I said, oh, okay. Right. Cause my daughter said, you should like him. He sounds like somebody you might you know, <laughs> like. Of course, he's, said, yeah, yeah, well, you know, I don't know, but <laughs> I, I started listening to it, you know, and I said, wow. That, and he's, of course, he's very creative, very creative. Yeah. And, and, and I say, you know, people that are wise and, and reach levels that people like equate on genius level, lots of times a part of that is having the right people around you and being uh -huh. open enough to explore some possibilities. And, and hit some, yeah. and some, some subjects, you know. You know, he has well with the rich kids, you know. It's 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 an interesting thing. Let's move into like Miles Davis. Oh Miles. Now Miles is another one that 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 I met at a very young age. Um I think um I now my parents love jazz, so they always listen to a lot of those different records. And um I think when I was real young, they they went to one of these places and miles played like like we had a family in 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 Jersey where they had a club that was a part of what they called it the Chitlin circuit and yeah. they would have a lot of different acts come through there. And somehow in the back of my memory I remember you know Miles playing there, you know, with a with a with a quintet or whatever, probably the group with with Herbie and Wayne and them because I it, I, I, Herbie I don't. Hancock, I, Herbie Wayne. Hancock, Wayne Shorter, Tony Williams, and Bon Carter, and and there were, there were a lot of different acts. I remember, you know, Grant Green, a bunch of people came to. So that didn't really register. On my second second week at college, up at Berkeley College of Music in Boston, mm -hmm. Miles um, presented his new On the Corner band. Mm. So, and this was the second performance of that group because they had opened the Ann Arbor jazz festival in Michigan and they were going to do a whole week in Boston and so I went to opening night and I'll say this going to see Miles 
whatever my thoughts were of what I was going to do in music, it totally changed. When I saw Miles, it was like, you talk about light bulbs go off, you see it in cartoons, <laughs> all of a sudden it was like, oh, okay, there's some other possibilities that are tying things together. Because I had had extensive training in music like all my life. And, and quiet as it's kept, my original aspiration in music was to be a, a euphonium player in the New York Philharmonic. <laughs> because I came up in orchestras playing, you know, different horns in the brass section. And th that was that was something that I loved to do. I, I loved or being in orchestras, really great, which, you know, has extended on my compositional side because I, I hear big pictures sometimes. It's a <laughs> small ensemble, right? So that that we went to the opening night to see Miles, and then the next day on the street corner of up the street from my dorm at Mass Ave and Boylston Street in Boston. Um, my roommate at the time is this incredible drummer from Wilmington, Delaware, named Wilby Fletcher, who after our first semester of school, wind up getting the gig with John Coltrane's piano player, McCoy Tyner, which was a, a victory for all of us, but that's another story. But with, with, with Wilby, he introduced me to M. Tume was on the street corner, because M. Tume was the percussionist with Miles. Mm -hmm. And and Toombs was like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, last night was great. You should come down. I'm going over to the club. You should come down, meet the cats and so and so. And we're like, yeah, sure, why not? So we go down to the club, and you know, we meet the guys in the band at the time, Reggie Lucas, who became Toombs' partner, and they went on to write "The Closer I Get to You" for Bird of Flag, and, and you know how to love me, Phyllis Hyman. They did, you know, uh, Stephanie Mills' first album when they became producers after being with Miles. So he, they was in the band. Michael Henderson, the mm. singer, You Are My Starship and all that. Mm -hmm. He was the bass player in that band. Um, Al Foster was a drummer. Um, there was a keyboard player named Cedric Lawson. Um, but Dal Roy on tablas, because Miles was combining. He was like doing world music before they called world music. Right. So he had an electric sitar player. And and him too, May was playing percussion. And he played percussion unlike any other percussionist I had ever heard. He was like up front, like right with Miles. And Miles would have conversation. Like Toons might be playing some rhythm and Miles might go, and he might go, and he might go, he go and he go, and then they go, I mean, it was, it was surreal. So I met Miles and probably because Miles loved him too many, like, like a son, you know, his family. Mm -hmm. That me meeting Miles through him too many, we had a, a connection. Right. You know, so I start hanging out, you know, I, every night. I was there every night. They, they did two sets a night for a week. So I got a chance to watch the music develop and hear them talk about, well, what happened the night before and what can happen the next night. You know, to actually step inside. I feel like I was inside the process <laughs> of this new music being created because Miles, right. at that time, he had gone from um, the standard type of jazz playing he played earlier in his career and he had embraced electricity and the technology. And, and he, was, he, was, he was already, it was the 20th century, but he was already in the 21st century. He might have been in the 23rd he century. he was constantly reinventing himself as far as his music. Reinventing but himself, before, reinventing music. There are a couple of other, uh, before we, because I want to really talk about your album, but I, I can't let you go without talking about two people, Nova Van Peoples and Bill Cosby. But we, let's do Melvin first. And then oh, we'll Melvin. Do... Oh, man. Sir Melvin. Sir Melvin, man. People. Yeah. Because people don't realize it, that Melvin had been knighted with the French Legion of Honor of Chevalier. So he was, I was at the ceremony. Okay. When he I was knighted. That. Yeah, yeah. So he's actually, sir, like the same, Miles also got that same, same um, coronation or whatever they call it. Yeah. He was also a Chevalier, you know? Mm -hmm. So, Melvin and I, um, he, he's another person that I met in my youth originally. I was probably a teenager and was doing a show at this club in Boston called Paul's Mall. And it was funny because it was two filmmakers. So it was Melvin and Topper Carew. Mm. Topper Carew helped to create the Martin TV show. Okay. And, and Topper was interesting because he was the first, he was the first brother I know that 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 actually was able to get like million dollar grants to do things. So it was like, whoa, okay. And for some reason or another, Topper was able to, to have a band that he would play 
Timbali's in front, and he would grunt on the mic, sort of like, right? So, so, and Melvin was doing his his music stuff from his records that he would do. You know, it was kind of like pre-rap rap. You know, he had the music playing, mm -hmm. and he would do his dialogue over, and he had this this blues way of singing. You know, so we connected at this gig because we did this gig together, and. Um, and over the years, I would run into him from time to time. He's like, yeah, yeah, man, call me, man, I'm in the phone book. He always said that, just call me, I'm in the phone book, right? <laughs> and eventually, like once I started to, to do some different production work, I was hired to work on an album with him to produce a, a record called Ghetto Gothic. Mm -hmm. And in that song, it was myself and, and Dunn Pearson did, did the other half of, of the record. And and it was very, very interesting because, you know, Melvin is a character. All I can say is that, <laughs> that very few individuals, especially um, melanatic individuals, do everything that they set out that they want to do. There was nothing that he didn't do, that he wanted to do. You know, he was, he's a playwright. He was an author. He was a poet. He was a singer. He was he 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 was one of the first. I think he was one of the first black men to be on the trading floor on the New York Stock Exchange. Wow! So so he was on the floor. He you know I don't know if you remember in the early days of Fox Television, there would be these little commercials that they would have a moment with Melvin Van Peebles, and he would come out and he would talk about well, you know, and he would talk about his. His thoughts on what could solve some of the social issues that were affecting America and the rest of the planet. <laughs> I mean, his wisdom is just so incredible. You know, the the techniques that he introduced as a filmmaker was adopted by so many others. He's considered the the godfather of modern independent cinema. Mm -hmm. But so many kids out there may not know who he is. Like they may know about his son. Mario Van Peebles, mm -hmm. who did New Jack City and some other things. They may know about that, but, but Melvin... Back. Well, right. you know, it's on... Yes. Again, Netflix has a lot of this stuff, Sweet Sweet Back, and um, there's a there was a, a film about Melvin Van Peebles that about his... You know, his oh, his, the one in which Mario plays him? That's, that's an incredible film. Well, no, no. This one is a documentary, but I I didn't see that. That's I have to look that up. But this is a documentary about how he made sweet sweet back. Oh, okay. I, I, that he had I, to I go remember through, that. You know, and with her wind and fire, how they got hooked up with it. Right. He discovered Earth, wind and fire. Yeah. yeah it's and uh, and which is a segue because. One of the, and I believe it was in one of these, I think this was the movie that you talked about, when he was trying to get money for Sweet Sweet back, he went to Bill Cosby for a loan. Right, right. Cosby, I think he was at the end of shooting, and some of the guys, you know, he was doing guerrilla filmmaking. So he was shooting places where they didn't necessarily have a permit, but he just went and just, okay, roll cameras, you know, right. and let's blow up this, this police car. And then film cameras stuff like that, and didn't know. So when the fire engines and everything and sweep back come, when the when the police car caught on fire, now they it, they it was a car of theirs. It wasn't an actual police car, but the fire raged in a way that they didn't expect it to. So there was a lot of moments that were caught like cinema cinema reality for him. And and, and you know just to go back with the documentary. When he was making sweet, like he had to get out of the union, so he made it an X-rated. <laughs> right, to, right, right, you know, right. He, go, he could fly under he, the radar. Right, fly under the radar because he wanted to to make a political statement with the film, and and they didn't know what they wanted because before that he had done Watermelon Man. He had directed yeah. Watermelon Man, and he, you know, his story is he he slipped into America via via Paris, by, from France, where he had made his first movies over there. So they, he came in as an import. They thought he was a, a, a Dutch filmmaker because they saw the name Van Peebles. So he came in and into America and they're, they're looking for Van Peebles. It's like, hey, it's me. And next thing you know, it's like they realized, oh wow, this is a black guy from France. <laughs> and so he wound up 
he, he just is very unconventional. You know, he came in and then he eventually got to do Watermelon Man. And because of that, when he got the deal to do Sweetback, they didn't know what kind of film it was. And like you said, he made it look like it was a, a, a blue movie, a porno movie. Because they would come in editing and they see naked him with naked girl going, and, and, and sex scenes. They were like, okay, and they walk away. But at the end, when I was saying that they were doing guerrilla filmmaking, he needed money, I think, to get some of the guys out of jail that had gotten arrested for <laughs> filming out on the street without a permit. And he had to go to, 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 to Bill Cosby, who gave him money to, to finish it up. So he wound up being able to finish and edit and do the film with the help of Dr. Cosby at the time. Speaking which he of did Dr. Back. Speaking of Dr. Cosby, because I want to leave some time for your stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about your relationship with Dr. Bill Cosby. Oh, it, it started, I, I always joke with him and say, well, you know, I came on board of the Cosby show on the second season. And that was when the show went to number one. Not to say that they had anything to do with me, but all the elements were in place to make a historic statement of what happened with him. Like I came on board with um, his musical director at the time, um, Stu Gardner. Um, I was invited in to come and do a session. And that session turned into another session, another session. And Wanda being the run of the show for all those seasons. And then also we did the spinoff, which was going to be the Lisa Bonet show, but it became a different world. So we wound up doing that. We would do the theme songs, all the incidental music. Like, like if people look back on the Cosby show, they'll say, wow, there was a lot of things that was going on with the music. Like, you know, we may come in with like a bossa nova and Theo's coming down the steps and all of a sudden it gets funky. And by the time you get to the bottom of the step, It'd be like a one, 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 one. It'd be a little wah, wah, little thing, but happened on the end. And, and it was a great experience because he used to come to the sessions. So I started to, to have a, a personal rapport with him as he started to come to the sessions because he's, he's a closet musician. You know, he, he wanted to be a drummer always. He used to talk about it routine. So he would come to the sessions and he would, and, and, Stu and, and the arrangers, they would have everything all laid out for something. Then he'd come in and it's like, okay, Dr. Cosby come in. This could change at any given moment. And one of the good things about being the type of musicians and artists that we are is that we're able to easily gravitate any kind of way that the music needs to go. That we're, you know, our knowledge of the totality of music allows us to go in any, anywhere, anywhere, any at any time, right? Mm -hmm. So he would come in and have a description like, he said, you know, I want you to make the sky open. And I would say, oh, um, Mr. Cosby, uh, what kind of sky is it? Um, a slightly overcast sky with the sun peering at a 32 degree angle over an alto cumulus cloud? <laughs> and he'd say, right, yeah, follow space, man, right? So then we would take off and create some things and it became like that kind of rapport. Uh -huh. So. When, when the Cosby show was over and um, and we did the spinoff for Malcolm Jamal Warner's show, here and now we did that. And then I started doing other TV shows, you know, I started working on New York Undercover, I was doing. And then even during that period, somehow he found me, he always finds me. I think um, Clarence Williams III was walking up the street, I was living up on Convent Avenue and they were filming up there. And I'm like, Clarence, how you doing? I hadn't seen him in a long time, right? And um, that's um, from the Mod Squad. He also played Prince's father in Purple right. Rain, right? Right. So he said, oh, I'm over here. I'm filming something over here with Bill Cosby. I said, oh, really? Oh, man, when you see him, tell him I said, hey. Tell him Space Man said, hey. He said, oh, you know Bill Cosby? I said, yeah. He said, well, he's over there filming right now. You should just go over to the gate and yell out to him. If he sees you and knows you, will come out. I said, knows you, okay. <laughs> Excuse me, he's trying to see if I actually know him, right? So I go over and I'm like, yo, Dr. C. And he comes out and he's like, oh man, oh man, it's great. We got an hour because he was doing the Cosby mystery. Mm -hmm. We can score a picture. Oh man, I got a session tomorrow. And, and that became another series. 
<coughs> excuse me. So with that, we would have all different kind of combinations of things. Like, you know, the, the score, it was an hour long show. And he used to joke and say, I don't know how Angela Lansbury is able to do this. She must have like 20 different stand-ins because this is grueling. It's not like being <laughs> on a fixed set during the Cosby show. You know, this was, this was a drama, you know. And it was like one of the first shows where we, where we were introduced to most deaf, Dante at the time. He, he mm-hmm. came out of the show, right? Try to keep these headphones on. So, so we would be in a studio. So he might have me, um, Youssef Latif, Arturo Sandoval, um, <laughs> a tabla player, somebody playing a shakuhachi flute or something, in different kind of combinations. You never knew what those sessions were going to be. So it was always exciting, you know? And 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 that was great. That, we only got one season with that. So it's cool, good. All right, see you later. And then he winds up getting the CBS show where he's playing the retired... Um, person that, that retired from working at the airport and we got like maybe like I think almost four or five years on that show so you know it over the time it extended being the kind of rapport we started doing side projects um, started doing live performances and you know I produced a record that, that the concept of um, he wanted to to do a, a, a rap record a hip hop record and, you know, I brought along said G from Ultramagnetic MCs, who I've been working with, to come and do this project. And, and we called it the Cosnerati, because originally it was the Cosby Narratives. And out of that, it became the Cosnerati, which, which is some name that hit me in my head. I said, it sounds good. It sounds like organization. Yeah, we belong to the Cosnerati. You know, we're doing this. And, and it was... A very interesting record was a project because he was trying to get any of the positive rappers, people who didn't want to use misogynistic words or or, or profanity. And we got together some guys that did it that were unknown. And the project, you know, I listened to it uh, relatively recently. I hadn't heard it in a while. And it was really like way ahead of its time of what it was outlining, what it was doing. So, you know, that was that kind of project that we did. And um, and then, you know, it's just the unfortunate reality is that with all that, the contributions to to black culture, to to culture of America, to music, to, to, to television that he's contributed to, you know, the, 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 the past years of this, quote unquote scandal stuff has kind of tarnished this image of this creative, brilliant individual of the work that he's done. And you know, it's 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 kind of sad because, you know, that throughout history and show business, there's been all different kind of people involved in a lot of different things. But the people who seem like they get passes have not had the kind of impact on the planet, like 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 Dr. C has. And we're gonna, say, what we're gonna do, space, because I I want to have some more time to talk about you and your album, but we can't go too far into it. We did talk a little bit about it, but I I wanted the the viewers to hear from someone who um, was with. Dr. Cosby for all these years. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people in the business really understand that there were some political issues that created this type of scandal. Uh, one of them was his uh, very close uh, uh, ability to purchase a major, it was NBC, and right. that created some 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 issues, and yeah, it probably started started, started things things, it, things start went, yeah things started with that. There's, and you know, plus there was um, a, a pipeline that under his property in Massachusetts that they wanted to run 
fuel through. Um, you know, there's a lot of issues, some things that, that you know, I wouldn't necessarily talk about in the public forum, but if, if people really can understand that the sensationalism is always on page one, the rebuttal or the finding of the truth of something else that's related to that sensationalistic headline is on page 28. So if people get caught up on page one, they don't hear the full story that exists on page 28. And there's just so much different stuff in there. All I know is that in watching the, the, the Supreme Court deliberate and talk about this, they all they said is this should have never gone to trial. This this whole thing was really pretty much, but in my estimate, like a travesty of justice, the way that all of it happened. There's things, there's things that nobody will ever know unless they were ever in the room with somebody. But the way that that the law works in America, it was definitely skewered on this individual. The way that it was handled, it, it's just so much. I mean, they could probably write books about this. And they probably will have textbooks in, in law about this particular case because it's, you know, and all we can do is just hopefully hope that we can experience that that that, that comedic genius, that storyteller, mm -hmm. and, and hear what he has to say because I know life has shown him some other things that would be very, very interesting because I'm sure he'll have a, a humorous viewpoint on the realities of life. Well, well you know, before we get into uh, your new project space, I know, uh, and I've got to kind of put a sampling out of it, is that uh, we were talking to Jazz and, and, and Matt McCoy, and there had been some conversations about uh, having Soul City be able to give a platform to, to just allow for all of the things that have taken place to um, to not have it just leave. And the only way that's going to happen is the black media to, to do that because, and even the black media sometimes is scared to tell the truth. But we're talking about a situation where, you know, the court said, this is BS, right. you know, right. and, and um, all of the things that, was said where you know people were paid off all of that stuff but the idea is there should be some way to at least allow for some people to see a, the the real side of dr william cosby and perhaps so city might be able to be helpful with that so that's something that's okay, yeah. conversation but that's there, another there, con that's a conversation of something that, that that has potential you know it just all depends upon but with things, because there's about, ongoing stuff still, you know, there's still that his legal team is fighting stuff like people just keep re rehashing, throwing things up. It's well, it's, whenever you can get money, I mean, you know, it's like you know, right, you, yeah. you know, uh, like a blood in the water, you know, uh, uh, right. You know. right. But let's let's move on to your latest projects they oh you're, man you're in, you're in the studio now where i'm in yeah i'm here in the studio i'm up up here and um it's it's a labor of love i'll say that day i've been blessed to be able to be able to challenge to channel this music that is coming from me it's like you know sometimes i wonder i say wow how is it that i'm able to write music that I think is beyond what I do. <laughs> but it but it is part of me. You know, it's like listening back because I've I started on this project a few years ago and it's just been ongoing. Because every time I start working on my project, I get a call to do something else with someone else. <laughs> so I always wind up putting my thing on the back burner. And I said, no, I'm going to do this record. I'm going to get this record out this year. So I've accumulated several tracks that I've recorded and um, it, the, the album is called Welcome to My Worlds. Um, mm -hmm. And the first um, volume one, so it's a three volume set. The volume one is, is subtitled Moon Over Harlem. And, <laughs> okay. and what it is, it's, it encompasses 
my, I'd say my creative artistic, excuse me, um, instrumental styles that I've garnered from being around a lot of jazz masters through the course of my life, that they've influenced me, my thoughts, um, systems and things, you know, from the, the from being around Miles and, and, and Ornette Coleman and Blood Omer and, you know, and Marcus Miller and a bunch of different people. And, and it's, it's wonderful because a lot of people have come on board to, to work with me on this project. I mean, it's a, it's a stellar group of individuals. I mean, I have, um, uh, I got people like, like uh, Will Calhoun, the drummer from Living Color. It's a very, very group. I've got Marcus Miller's playing bass on some things. Um, the bass player from the Rolling Stones, um, um, Daryl Jones Munch is playing on some things. Um, I got uh, Joe Sample's son is on it. Um, um, Funkin' for Jamaica, Tom Brown is playing on some things. I got <laughs> Gary Bartz on it from Miles' group. I've got Don Braden on it. Um, um, Jay Rodriguez, um, um, Donnie Hathaway's percussionist, Chucky Carter is playing on it. Um, oh, man, it's... it's um, Alex Blake is playing upright, you know, they played with Billy Cobham and, and Randy Weston. So it's like, oh, it's a combination of people. Um, um, Leslie Ming on drums, Larry Peters. It's, and you, you know, this, it's, a, it's a who's who in the world of creative circle. Wallace Roney, who was Miles' protege, is playing trumpet on a few tunes, like something that I had written for Miles. <clears throat> After we did the Amandala album, was looking forward to the next one after he finished Duba, and I wrote a piece that I wanted to do on it, but Miles, you know, went back to where he came, you know, and, and we lost him, so, and being able to be around Wallace at that time, he came in and played beautiful. I mean, you know, oh, it's, 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 it's been a labor of love. Hmm. <laughs> so, me. are you doing any sets or anything Besides your recording, or you? Well, I've been I've been taking the ensemble out. We've been playing live a couple of places. We just mm -hmm. did something at um, Riverbank State Park a few weeks ago, and that was fun. And mm -hmm. I'm getting ready to. I wish you had to let me know, brother. I would have <laughs> loved to check you out. Oh man, it was it was it was fun. We had a good time. But everybody's in the, in the ensemble is excited. They're like, man, we got to do more. But I also, I didn't know if I told you I did a movie. No. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you have any water? Is any water by nature? Any water? Okay, sorry. This guy's getting water. I did a movie called Paris is in Harlem. And and it took place in the Paris Blues Club that's up there. Yeah, yeah. The one, yeah. And it's very interesting because um, it it's, how do I describe it? It's historical because it's dealing with um, what, what happened with the, the, the cabaret laws mm -hmm. and, and how that was, was finished under Mayor de Blasio. So mm -hmm. it catches something that's a point in time historically. But the story, excuse me, well, I can stop coughing with it now. <laughs> the mm -hmm. story takes place with all these different little vignettes of, of characters that all convene at the club. And mm. I'm, I'm one of the, I play one of the musicians in the club. But when, also, is it out or is it coming out or how can Well, you... it, 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 we premiered it at the, um, at the Harlem Film Festival. Right. But it's probably gonna come in some limited use. I know that for the Charlie Parker Festival that's gonna happen at the end of August, it's mm -hmm. gonna be shown there and I'll be playing with the individual film course. It also focuses on young child prodigy, um, Kojo Rooney, the drummer, mm -hmm. who has a, a great part in, in, the, in the movie. And his father, Antoine Rooney, who is Elvin Jones, Coltrane's drummer's last saxophone player. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's hard to describe. It's like, uh, I think it's the only film that captures a scene in New York City, in Harlem, musically, of that that we haven't seen in the mm -hmm. 21st century almost like the way that round midnight captured right, right, that right. that scene in europe at that time this 
is 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 a modern day. I'm not going to try to equate it with that, but it's a very very interesting piece. And you know, I I talked with the filmmaker, and we could try to get it where a lot more people can see it because mm -hmm. it 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 has a definitive statement. How long is it? Um, it's it's running back like about a two hour film. It's a, it's a full it's a feature film. Mm -hmm. It's a feature film, um, and um, yeah, I can, I can say it's it's different. So that's something I just recently did. See, lots of times I have to be reminded of what I'm doing. So, mm -hmm. like you, you bring these names up of people, I say like, oh yeah, I did I did work with that <laughs> artist so, because you know yeah, I'm just living life. I've been blessed to be able to be around some of the most um, amazing individuals on planet Earth, <laughs> you know, present company included, and <laughs> and it's like it, it, it's humbling to be able to be a part of of an artistic community of a mm -hmm. uh, community of intelligence, you know, because I'm I'm a firm believer of how important that music is to our culture, to our mm -hmm. development, to for our freedom of our, our of, from a lot of this stuff that we are encountering on a day-to-day -day basis, that music has a way to be able to take us places, let us experience different moods and, and, and intimacy, friendships, all different types of things. And, and you can pretty much chronicle the the degradation of the of the inner city communities from them taking a lot of the music programs at the schools mm. you know it's um it's important it's a part of I, I say that we're real we really represent the creative artists of color in America represent what America what what is America created <laughs> I mean it at the end of the day it's it's about it's about our creativity America in all different ways of, from building this country to building this country to <laughs> sustaining this country to creating what this country profits off of you know yeah. so it's um it's very important that that the arts gets exposed to people very young and that they get a chance to have a personal contact. That's why I'm looking forward to taking the ensemble out. Because when we play, it's like a history lesson. Without it being a history lesson, because the music encompasses it all. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. we talked about the jazz side, funk. What's the name of the ensemble? The ensemble is Spaceman Patterson and the Celestials. The Celestials. The Celestials, yes. So, so we tap in different aspects of the cosmos. Because we didn't even talk about like my time at Sun Rock. But, you know, like you said, we have to do several shows to yeah, talk about many the facets. Sun Rye and the Boots yeah, yeah. Collins, who's, oh, yeah, now, Boots. who's yeah. now doing some things with some young people music, too. I'm hearing yeah. him, you know, yeah. in, in some of the, the, the new songs of his, 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 his style. But Space, it's always a pleasure, brother. We're, we're going to definitely, once, you know, you finally decide how you're going to put your uh, album out, we'll, we'll have you back to do some things and 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 go Harlem.org. We want to see how we can uh, connect. That's the Harlem Tourism Board's uh, website to to connect with that, to use that as a promotion. I'll talk to you about after that. Okay. No, and, that'd and be great. Soul City. There may be some things, you know, with Soul City that can be some live streaming and some other things that yeah, yeah that, that that's wonderful because you know problem it's it's still happening i mean talk about the different levels of of renaissance through the years well, that this, this is the second Harlem renaissance that's yeah. we're in and go harlem.org is the official website for the harlem uh tourism and hospitality industry have a new hotel we got to get you a gig at the do Harlem Marriott Hotel at some point. Oh, there, there we go. Yeah, we can. And you know, do. I'm, I'm, I'm open and available <laughs> to create in any type of venue that would invite us. And well, we've been people. talking about creating some partnerships for a long time. You know? Yes, sir. Yes, you know? sir. 
So listen, thank you. Give my regards to Chris and, and all of the family. And um, and now that we've connected, we need to just stay connected, okay? Yeah, let's 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 do it. Keep, hey, keep me posted and, and we'll talk about some things, all right? Yes, the art of war. <laughs> I have to send you the book. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, well, again, uh, uh, William Spaceman Patterson, uh, the legendary William Spaceman Patterson. Thank you for your time. Appreciate you. And we're going to have you back because I, you know, there's just so much stuff. I mean, the, you know, we didn't talk about the Isley Brothers. We didn't talk about any of those other oh, yeah. things. I mean, you know, we didn't even talk about the fullness of New York Undercover, which right. they've, which they've, they've started to show every day now. So it's back. Like sometimes people say, I saw you on TV last night. I'm like, huh? Oh, right, right, right. So, <laughs> and, and we did, and before we go, we did shoot a reboot pilot before COVID. For? Of an update for New York Undercover. Uh-huh, okay. And f from what I understand, Dick Wolf was shopping it. But right. because the pandemic, I don't know where the status of things are, but it was very, very interesting. Because, you know, as opposed to, you know, Gladys Knight was Natalie. The, the club was inherited by her niece played by Carrie Hilson. Huh. And, you know, and then, you know, it, it was, it's really interesting that, that they were able to do it. We had the new Natalie's. I think the first two guests that we did was uh, Jasmine Sullivan uh -huh. and, and, and Luke James that played Johnny Gill in, in the uh, new edition story. It was on Treme, the, the show that would, takes place in New Orleans. New York undercover. Yeah, so there may be life to the next phase of it. And, and it was so funny. It called me and said, hey, let's, let's do it again. I'm like, hey, all right, <laughs> let's do it again. <laughs> Spaceman, thank you yeah. so much. And we'll keep, I have to look at that. It comes on every day. I, I think I've seen that. So we yeah. have to look. Thank you, my brother. Okay, and thank, thank you for, for again, uh, you and on. I, I, I hear you every week when urbanology the art of war when oh, man. so again labor, thank you. labor of love brother <laughs> labor of love take care okay you and, too uh, that's pretty much our show for today um again uh william uh spaceman patterson was my guest it was great to reconnect with my brother and and i appreciate it and i hope to um see everyone Next week, uh, uh, have an uh, interesting show. Um, and uh, Vandy Curtis Hall, uh, who's an actor, lives in Harlem, another Harlemite. He's actually just had a new show on um, Netflix, uh, The Recruit, I believe. Vandy has been around for, for a minute, too. And his wife was the one who just directed um, Harriet. And um, uh, um, she, the, the 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 new movie uh, that 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 that's but we'll talk about that. Time is 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 short. So thank you again, Space. We'll talk to you, and I'll see everybody next week. And right. and and Jazz, thanks for for being behind the scenes and keeping us in, in point. Take care, everybody. Uh, this is Tony Rogers. Take care. This is Kia Rogers, and you're listening to Urbanology with my dad, Tony Rogers, on WHCR 90.3 FM New York.
Hey, hey. hey.